This is Emily Hull with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. Today is Sunday, April 22nd, 2018, and I'm in Tulsa interviewing Dr. Janetta Calhounish. Janetta, you're an award-winning poet, writer, literary scholar, and the 2017-2018 State Poet Laureate. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you for inviting me. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Hobart, Oklahoma, which is in southwestern Oklahoma. Um, but uh, came to Wewoka where my mother's family was by the time I was a year and a half old. So and I lived there all that time and graduated from Wewoka High School. All right. So what stands out about Wewoka? How, how would you explain the town to maybe people who've never visited? Um, one thing I didn't realize that was really different about my hometown until I moved somewhere else was that it's, we're, it's always been a tri-racial town black, white, and Indian. It was founded by John Horse, who was half Seminole and half African-American. Um, and uh, our schools were integrated in 1958. Um, and I had friends of you know, all different classes and colors. And, uh, and I figured out later that a lot of Oklahoma towns aren't like that, yeah. so, especially small towns, sorry. Um, get more of that in the city. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing that's different. It's also the capital of the Seminole Indian Nation of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, it was historically the Seminole resettlement area, right? A reservation at the time. Let's see what else. Mm -hmm. Favorite places to go or hang out, maybe the downtown or? Well, there's not much left yeah. there anymore. Uh, unfortunately. However, uh, in October we have the Sorghum Day Festival, mm -hmm. which is the FFA grows the sorghum cane, and they have an old uh, sorghum mill, which is two big stones, and this mill is pulled around by two mules, and they press uh, the juice out of it right there and cook it right there, mm -hmm. and you get take home a jar of oh. sorghum, and you know, it's like other Oklahoma small town festivals. There's mm -hmm. music, there are craft booths, there's a car show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's so the town actually has people in it, a lot of people in it, at least during that one weekend in October. Mm -hmm. um, so that that makes it a little different. Um, it's a county seat of Seminole County. Let's see what else. Um, we go to the lake. Uh, there's a lot of you know ponds and lakes and fishing places all in that whole area. A lot of them are uh, Corps of Engineers Park and Trail Lakes. Mm -hmm. uh, Wewoka Creek, uh, which uh, was in a very famous film by a guy down the road from me from Coldwellville, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. Mr. Sterling Carter. Barking mm -hmm. water is what Wewoka means. That oh, is okay, yeah. And it refers to the rapids in Wewoka Creek. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, so when you think creek, some people think small, but this is a really good sized creek. I think it has like 36 flood control dams on it. Did you like all the fishing and yeah. things like that? Yeah, and my grandparents' farm had one of those flood control lakes all over the creek. Yes, I spent a lot of time fishing with my grandpa, mm -hmm. you know, hanging out and playing on the farm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just uh, leading with a friend of mine from high school who's been teaching at Langston for 30 something years. Uh, and uh, he was pointing out how, um, when we were at school there, anyway, that. Um, Everyone was encouraged to be um, intelligent and a good student, which I don't think always happens, particularly in small towns. And I don't mm -hmm. mean just one or two people. It was like a point of pride to uh, be a good student. Mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't kind of that dragging down or making fun of people who were smart or, or writers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, it was an interesting moment to grow up. Yeah. It was still a very healthy town. In 1979, when I graduated, and then in 1983, all four of our clothing manufacturing companies closed up and went south of the river. And it pretty much killed the town and said we were really recovered. So you mentioned your grandparents' farm. Can you tell me a little bit about your grandparents? Uh, maybe their names, what stands yeah. out about their personalities? Uh, uh, my grandmother is Mary Jeanette Roberts. It's her maiden name, Sanderson. My grandpa is Luther Leland Sanderson, um, both native Oklahomans. Actually, my 
Granny's family of Roberts. They're both from Southern Oklahoma, Newerton. Mm -hmm. I mean, sorry, Healton and Orr, which is L R R, um, Oklahoma, and um, which are about thirty miles west of Armour. <clears throat> but my Granny's people have been in Oklahoma. We have some pictures that are dated in the eighteen hundreds, mm -hmm. like eighteen eighty. So um, they uh, came and came up and lived in, in that part of Oklahoma long before statehood. So uh -huh. my grandpa was born in North Texas, uh, but uh, came to Oklahoma when he was a tiny child. His first Oklahoma home, their log cabin is actually under Texas Lake. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we've been Oklahomans for several generations. Yeah. Did they ever tell you um, stories that they might remember from their families and things like that? Oh, yes. And I yeah. was always asking, and you know, my first book of poems, uh, Work is Love Made Visible, is full of some of those stories. Mm -hmm. And the stories I heard later, and you know, it's got family photographs in it because at Christmas when all the cousins were home and everybody was home, it could be usually, uh, you know, like the oldest woman in the family who was there would take the photograph album mm -hmm. and sit and tell, tell you who those people were and where yeah. they were from and what they did. Uh, and then we would, later on my grandpa got a slide camera and so we had like 10 carousels of slides that we'd watch every Christmas. And again, you know, everybody said, oh, remember that was down at Granny's house in Chickasha or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there were, our grandpa loved cameras. He, he had one of those uh, crank eight millimeter cameras. So we had the movies mm -hmm. and again, you know, well, this is who those people are. And I had those all transferred uh, to DVDs and for the uh, movies, actually my uncle did a voiceover to make sure that uh, everyone can know who people were. He took that role and said, well, that's so-and-so and that's at that house. And that was about the year uh -huh. X. So yeah, they're full of stories. Yeah, that's full a really stories. nice thing to have. Is there a particular photograph that you can think of that well, maybe inspired you or captivated you in some way? Um, well, I particularly love the one that's on the front cover of my first book. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, my my grandpa's actually in that picture. This little okay. boy yeah. with the beanie cap and yeah. the girl uh, uh, next to him in the black dress is his uh, elder sister who died in twelve weeks of scarlet fever. Oh. And my name was a combination of my granny's name. They, she was always called Jeanette. Mm -hmm. Nobody called her uh, Mary. And his sister's name, whose name was Juanita. So I'm Jeanette. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. kind of cool. um, but that one of the things that fascinates me about that photograph uh, is the um, the way it's composed. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then when my uh, mom and granny passed, and I, I got all the family pictures, boxes and boxes and boxes, I found the negatives for those. They're three oh. by five negatives. And um, actually, when I'm at the Oklahoma Historical Conference. I'm going to ask some people if they can help me figure out who took those because it wasn't WPA, it was too early. And I'm thinking it was probably one of the mm -hmm. photographers with the Farm Services Administration. Oh. So it would have been like 1920 mm -hmm. those were taken because my grandpa was about five. So um, that whole series of pictures is, I, I just look at them over and over again because they're both mm -hmm. beautiful art and they're also my family. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's so neat to, to have that, that part of your your history. Was there a particular place on the farm that you liked the best? Uh, Can well, you that down? there was a big oak tree mm -hmm. uh, down near the lake. Uh, I'm going to say it had a tree house in it. It didn't. Mm -hmm. It just had a platform and some boards nailed mm -hmm. to the side. And uh, I would go up there and, uh, you know, with some cheese and crackers or some peanut butter and sit all day. And I think that's where I, I first wrote. Oh, whether okay. I wrote it down on paper or not, but that's where I was mm -hmm. think, gathering images. And I was so pleased that uh, my current series of uh, bio photos, there's mm -hmm. one with me and Tom Reeds leaning against the tree. It's yeah. that tree. The people who oh, were living okay. on the farm yeah, let me uh, go out with the woman, Gay Paisley, who took those photographs. Mm -hmm. okay. So I got to have to photograph that one at the farm and a couple of others. Mm -hmm. And others are we went to high school, so mm -hmm. we went home to take pictures. Yeah, so you mentioned um, you know, like sitting in the, in the tree and thinking and writing and reading. thinking about reading. Um, what's your earliest memory of writing poetry or writing or just 
having a level of well, I could read and write when I went to first grade. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I, as I say in one of my poems, I don't think I'd actually read the whole sentence, but I could read black words. Because yeah. I asked my mom and she'd show me. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the first thing I think I ever learned to read was the label on the ketchup bottle. Yeah. Yeah, because I was staring at it all dinner, mm -hmm. you know, figuring it out. Um, but I wrote my first poem in second grade. Okay. Well, you know, I sometimes call myself the depressive poet. <laughs> um, we lived in a house that had, like a lot of Oklahoma houses did, that were built in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Our windows were high, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because it didn't let in so much heat. Right? You had windows that are up high on the wall. And I heard a commotion outside and stood on the bed to see my dog being attacked by a pack of feral dogs. He was old yeah. and, um, and they killed him. You know, I tried for him to run out there. My mom was like, oh, yeah. Ooh. And that was what I wrote my poem about, about my dog being killed. But yeah. I took it to school. And my yeah. home teacher in second grade, Mrs. Carolina, who was a two-time Oklahoma teacher of the year, oh. um, Valerie Caroline, um, you know, put it on the bulletin board. And my mom put it, you know, in the star place on the fridge, you know, on the freezer portion at the top right in the middle. So, um, it was celebrated, and I thought, well, that's something I can do. Mm -hmm. so, my mom read poetry to me. Okay, yes, I have to ask, to ask you that. What, what that experience is like, or what you remember her? Um, I don't ever remember a time she didn't read to me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, I got old enough uh, to read on my own. But um, it was, the most amazing thing is that my mom was teaching me genre. Mm -hmm. She'd say, well, this is a story, this is something somebody imagined. Um, she said, but there's, you know, there's some good, true things in there. It was just imagined. She said, this is a poem. And, you know, people write poems when they have strong emotions, stuff like this. Um, she wrote poetry herself. Um, yeah. I have it. Um, and yeah. she also, uh, yeah, she continued to write. You know, she kept it under the bed mm -hmm. <laughs> in a special box. Um, but she also, when she was in high school before, um, she got married. Yeah, she got married at 16 and they wouldn't let you finish high school when you were married. Um, she did, um, oh, now I can't think of the name. So she'd go declaim poetry at speech contests, declamation, mm -hmm. I can't remember, dramatic interpretation is what it was called. Mm -hmm. And I have her medals that were like charms for a charm bracelet. But I also have the type written sheets that she typed out to memorize those poems. And they include Frost and Byron an Emily Dickinson poem, which would have been really early for anybody to know about Emily, because mm -hmm. that would have been in 1956. Yeah. And she wasn't really broadly known then. But I have all of those, um, her typewritten, so I could see what she was reading at the time. But she really, really loved Robert Frost. I actually mm -hmm. have the little, it's a little tiny penguin paperback called, you know, Selected Poems of Robert Frost, and it was hers. Mm -hmm. So I still have that. Did she keep notes? In, oh, in her in the margins, he no, 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 right the books. <laughs> no, no, and I don't either. And this yeah. is why uh, we, uh, you know, we didn't have books in our house for a long time because we we didn't have the money to buy books uh, until we went to an auction one time and bought like four boxes of books for a dollar. But <clears throat> uh, for my mother, books were kind of sacred objects, mm -hmm. and we weren't allowed to read a book until we washed our hands. No dog hearing, no writing, you know, hardcore about those things. And that's kind of, they were special to her. And also most of our books were from the library. So, you yeah. know, we're in the face of the library. No, no, no. So, and I won't do it either. My books are like when I was getting my PhD and studying, they're all like full of sticky notes. Because mm -hmm. then I can take notes and refer to them, but I don't think I just book. Yeah. Big book, capital B. <laughs> my granny was a reader too. I, yeah. uh, when she went blind, mostly blind later in her life. Um, so she started getting the books. I hooked her up with the Oklahoma Library for the Blind, who sent you know, sending books on tape, the tape mm -hmm. machine to play it. And they had something like a limit of four books a month, oh. or four books at a time, and you were only supposed to be in the order. She talked them into, she was like getting 15 books a month. Oh, wow. Yeah, books on tape. Mm -hmm. She loved history. She likes uh, you know, popular histories, written, you know, say you know, academic histories, but real good histories and biographies uh, written for the general public. So, yeah. yeah. 
the long, long line of readers and, and, yes. um, and poets. What do you think it is about poetry that draws you in? Why poetry? Me personally? Yeah. Uh, I think I didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, it's the first creative act I remember doing, you know, other than making things for Christmas presents, mm -hmm. crafting things, um, was, was to go to poetry. Um, I think poetry chose me. Mm -hmm. um, my family, uh, you know, they're musicians, and my granny, when she retired at 65, she started painting. She said, oh, you know, uh, artistic pieces, and my mom played the piano and sang her poetry, mm -hmm. and, you know, everybody's got some kind of art. Uh, I think a lot of it comes from the, um, you know, the kind of Scots-Irish heritage because mm -hmm. both of those people, peoples have a love for word and for music. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that was really the one thing I could do well was to write. I've been writing, I think I wrote my first family obituary when I was in sixth grade because I was the writer. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's the person who can bake good cakes in the family. There's the one who can... Um, Make clothes, both my granny and grandpa worked in the clothing factories, so mm -hmm. they could do fantastic sewing and pattern making. And then there's the guy in the family that always fix your car. Mm -hmm. Well, early on, I became the writer in the family, so mm -hmm. I was the one who did that. Mm -hmm. yeah. What were your favorite subjects in, in school? Oh, uh, well, you know, reading in English, yeah. writing. I actually, for a while, was good at math. Actually, mm -hmm. I think my SAT scores in math were higher than they were in English. Mm -hmm. um, but that's because the English the English language SATs at that time, that part of it, were very uh, culturally and class-based. Mm -hmm. Like, there was a question about polo. All I knew about polo was that it was a thing on some people's shirts, right? So yeah. I couldn't answer that question about what was going on in the polo match. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I kind of, um, I guess I finally bumped into uh, some math that I actually, my second year um, algebra, I finally realized that those letters were supposed to be numbers. I'd been manipulating symbols the whole time and had no idea that they were actually had numerical equivalents. Oh, wow. <laughs> my math notebooks were full of poetry anyway. Quite mm -hmm. poetry. So it just, I love to read. Mom, my mom said that I actually could read when I was like two. And I'm like, are you serious? She said, yeah. And she told me a story about, um, we were at the grocery store, and this was the period when they first had like generic brands, and all they were were like white cans with a black, with the black name of what it was, like tomatoes or corn or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she said that she was standing in the aisle getting some generic things, and I said, corn, and she said, Oh, no, I don't know if she wasn't paying attention. I said, corn. She was not paying attention. And then she put a can of something else in there. And I said, not corn. It had no pictures on it. It only mm -hmm. had them. So I knew that corn was C-O-R-N. Yeah. I don't know that You don't know? That you don't know? Mm -hmm. But I thought that was always funny. It had to do with corn. So what did you want to... Uh, do after high school, or did you always know you wanted to be a writer, or what, what led you to? Well, I never ever, once I started writing, I never stopped. Yeah. Um, there were some um, very difficult um, things in my upbringing, and it, it saved my life, poetry yeah. did. Uh, but I didn't know. I went to school uh, originally. I went to University of Houston uh, in pre med. Hmm. But I got, uh, and I, I started working in a local hospital when I was 16 under a grant program to introduce uh, poor and working class kids to health professions. And I love that. I like the puzzle of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I like the narrative part. You know, people tell you something, yeah. you have to learn something from the story. But uh, I drowned. I didn't finish my first semester of college. And then I came back home. And I think when I actually really went to college, when I was 37 years old, I had like 11 hours from four different junior colleges in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked and, and I wrote and I never stopped writing. But I just, uh, yeah, 
it was it was as much for me like a way to under hear myself think uh, as it was anything. And then yeah, yeah, my, my first poem was published when I was 23. And it was published in a magazine called Piecework, which I wouldn't even know about in this mm-hmm. oral history because it was a women's literary magazine that uh, was in some way associated with um, Oklahoma City University, but also the, I think it's called the Women's Center. And there is a poet and a literature professor at Oklahoma City University, whose name is Abigail Keegan. Mm-hmm. And a few years back when I did the Oklahoma Anthology, you know, like Abigail sent some stuff in and I accepted it. And then when she sent her bio, I was floored because Abigail was the poetry editor of Peacework. Oh, wow. And she's who chose my very first poem to be published. Cool. Yeah. This is person who now is a friend and a, uh, you know, colleague. And I was like, oh my gosh, were you actually the poetry editor this year? And she says, yes, yes, I was. I said, you chose my first poem. <laughs> what was it about? Um, mm-hmm. It was about, it was a, a woman's poem. And mm-hmm. I actually have it at home. I could send it to you later. Yeah, sure. Uh, but it was kind of a metaphorical thing about, you know, patching together women's lives. So that was, that was mm-hmm. kind of cool. Yeah. Is there a particular job that, that you had that maybe you feel uh, taught you a lot of things or that you used in some way to inspire um, your work? Well, I worked for years uh, fairly regularly in hospitals and uh Nursing homes as a mm-hmm. as a nurse's aide uh, or lab and X-ray and EKG, which I had learned on the job in Wiloka, which was great because it gave me a way to make a living for a while, and um, you learn a lot about human nature when you deal with people when they're sick or when they're dying. Yeah, um, and I thought it was it was profound for me. I think in my first book I actually have a a poem written when I actually worked in Hillcrest Hospital in Thompson, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, about a woman who was dying. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this one woman, that's a different one, this was an Ina, this one woman, she was dying of cancer and horrifically dying of cancer. And yet she said, please and thank you mm-hmm. for everything. And uh, I remember that she hung on long enough to go to her son's high school graduation, oh, wow. which dying people often do. They put it off, and and then when she um, was about to go, she was praying and thanking God for her life. And I remember it made me angry. Mm-hmm. I mean, how could you be thanking me for that? Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I understood what a beautiful thing that was, and that was just part of her nature. Because she said, "May I please do a pain shot?" When she was in agony. For, Mm-hmm. Nurse came to give her pain. She said, "Thank you very much." It was this kind of um, beautiful fortitude that I couldn't have seen in other places. So the hospital, mm-hmm. for sure. I also bartended a lot, and mm-hmm. there's always a million stories. Yeah, you know, there's this that kind of thing about the bartender is a person that they tell their troubles to. Well, that's that's uh, sometimes happens, yeah. but there's also just stories, and you see stories happen. So yeah, mm-hmm. that's just that that observation. That yeah. can they go? I actually worked here in Tulsa at 51st right. and Union. Mm-hmm. Do drop in. Do drop in. Mm-hmm. What was that like? <laughs> <laughs> it was a working class bar. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, pool tables, jukebox. Mm-hmm. Um, loved most of the people there most of the time. You yeah. know, a lot of people who grew up in Tulsa or around Tulsa, mm-hmm. and a lot of them still won't go to West Tulsa because it's considered the rough part of town. But they were very much <clears throat> like the people I knew, like mm-hmm. the people I grew up with, so I was at home there. Yeah. One of my friends, actually, from that period, he's known me since I was 20, came to my reading last night. Oh, really? Yeah. Drove all the way down from Scott to, to come, so it was cool to see him there. Yeah, with those connections. Yeah. Still friends. Maybe it was a week or two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So those are basically the... Pro- oh, I did try one time uh, to do, like they had a telephone, you know, call people and talk them into buying things to mm-hmm. being MMS and have a day. Yeah. I couldn't, it felt so deeply morally wrong and then 
because it was basically a con game. Um, and this uh, and this little lady answered the phone, and she sounded just like my grandma. Oh. And I apologized to her, hung up the phone, and I said, "I'm out of here." And I really, I really needed that job right then, but I just couldn't do it. Yeah. So I think um, pretty much, I mean, and most all the poets I know have, are going around gathering images all the time. Mm-hmm. And people ask me about inspiration, and um, and I think. Most of the time they say inspiration, but they're talking about like something that falls on you. It's like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like say Paul, you know, in the desert and poof. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that's not how it works for me. And I'm not sure that's how it works for all poets. We go around and in our minds, we're writing, gathering up images all the time and we're listening to stories and thinking about stories that making up stories for things that don't have stories. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I can't ever say that when people say what inspires you, I'm like, well, everything, yeah. <laughs> everything. Um, I do write a lot of poems about, um, particularly the Oklahoma landscape because it's so deeply a part of how I know myself. It seems strange, but it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, the particular smell in certain seasons, uh, and this rainy season smell. Mm-hmm. And the sounds of the cicadas, which we I grew up calling locust. I didn't know they were called cicadas for years. It's the lo- locusts were their colloquial name. Yeah. And you know, it was really, really hot, like 110 degree late August days, and the locusts are humming. And then the sun starts to go down, and the fireflies come out. Mm-hmm. I missed that. I was gone for many years from Oklahoma, and I just got to where I couldn't stand it anymore. Yeah. I miss the landscape, and I miss, uh, I miss the people. Mm-hmm. Of course, like a lot of Oklahomans, I sometimes have a love-hate relationship with my state, but yeah. I've managed to uh, figure out how to do that yeah. and still love parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> so. What do you think you miss the most? And you talked a little bit about the land, but and scents and smells and things like that. But is there anything else that just kind of maybe weighed on you more at some parts in your, of your life or than others that would I, remind you? I really it? didn't feel at home anywhere else. I traveled a lot, mm-hmm. especially in my 30s, or like 20s and 30s. And I traveled a lot. And I came to realize that I was so that I didn't feel at home anywhere. I didn't know the plants and animals and trees and their names, mm-hmm. or that I didn't know, uh, you know, when you get the hair on the, raising on your arms when there's a tornado in the area, it's time to go to the sun. <laughs> the thunderstorms, of course, are so magnificent. But it, it just seemed to be, um, because my family had been here for so long, and it's knowing the land is deeply associated with my grandpa. Mm-hmm. She said we'd be walking around on the farm, and he'd say, "Oh, that's a meadowlark, you know." There's a uh, opossum grapes down by the lake, and, and all that kind of thing. So it was also deeply associated with the with the man who I was really like my father. Mm-hmm. Um, he was so peaceful. He had such a peaceful spirit, and I was always talking and busy, so he was good for me. So so much of it was associated with. Um, the farm and my grandpa and my granny and my mom that I would could I don't think I could separate out the homesickness between people and land and mm-hmm. animals yeah. and plants. I don't think I can pull them apart. And you know I, I just taught a workshop on sense of place for Tulsa Lit Fest and I have this uh, great article that I used to teach that with it's actually from a sociologist talking about what what sense of place can be made up of it's just how like five different kinds of sense of place and I, I and I mine are all all intertwined they don't come apart family history uh, my own history the land the water yeah yeah it's I'm still you know I still write I mean all a lot of my writing is trying to figure that out mm-hmm. it's trying to figure out what is it you know, yeah, some people can question. just get up and leave and, and never miss it. And I used to be gone, like I said, for a long time. But I, I, I mean, I had dreams about um, driving on Highway 9. Hmm. I have an essay in my oh, book. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Number 9? <laughs> yeah. Um, I wrote that for Oklahoma Today. Um, 
But I really did have those dreams, like I would have dreams of driving between Woke and Norman on Highway 9, which mm -hmm. um, still is a somewhat dangerous highway, but it was even worse than any of yeah. these these really long hills, and there's already always deer, you know, jumping out at you. Um, and we drove entirely too fast on it, for those of my teens, mm -hmm. as one should, um, when you're <laughs> young and invincible. Um, but uh, I, I really literally had those dreams that a lot of my homesickness dreams came in the form of driving on Highway 9, <laughs> which, you know, was quite a metaphor for me because I was born on one end of Highway 9 and grew up on the other end. Right. And then oh. I met my husband at OU and he took me to his house and lived on Highway 9. I'm like, okay. okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> how you knew. <laughs> That's how I knew. So, yeah, so I did. I dreamed Oklahoma a lot, but in, in really kind of not narrative dreams at all. It's mm -hmm. a metaphor for images of dreams. Mm -hmm. So I came up. Do you keep journals of your dreams? You know, I don't. Uh, actually, my poems end up being journals of mm -hmm. my dreams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I was a, you know, the writer kid, every year I, somebody would buy me one of those little uh, diaries with the mm -hmm. little like, you know. I have, I never finished them. I would write like five days and I'd get bored with it. I'm like, no, today I ate chicken. You know? <laughs> um, and there have been other times in my life I've tried to keep a journal. But for me, usually, uh, the, I do so much of the pre writing of the poem in my head that the poems are more like what other people's journals entries would be. And I just, I get bored with myself. So I don't, I'm not a good journal keeper. Mm -hmm. I tried. Yeah. I, I tried even recently again, and it just doesn't. Yeah, yeah everyone <laughs> has a different. Everyone has an opinion process. on that, which I found kind of interesting through these interviews. Some people are avid journal keepers, and others are like, oh, no, it's not how I yeah. do things. Yeah, you know, Nathan Brown is a like everyday poem journal keeper. Wow. He's amazing. Um, and I just, yeah, I don't know why it bored me, but it bored me. So mm -hmm. I'd rather be reading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, tongue-tied woman, um, mm -hmm. can you tell me what it was like putting that book together, publishing that book, how it made you feel as a poet then and maybe now? Um, I'm actually, I have actually, this trip, been reading some pieces from there. They're not mm -hmm. all perfect. It was my first book. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but there's some things I really like about it. And some of those poems... So I think what was it published in 2000? I can't remember. 2002? Yeah, 2002. So I had just started my master's degree in 2002. Mm -hmm. and, um, but some of these poems were written in my 20s, my 30s. You know. um, I'm a fairly s slow writer. Um, mm -hmm. I don't mean I don't like just actually getting it on a paper, but gathering up a group, a big enough group of things to make a book. So that's probably 15 years in the making. Mm -hmm. And um, I have by that time been met other poets and you know, I heard people talk about, well, here's how you do a book, and, you know, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. So when I saw this competition come through, um, I had all these, you know, written down somewhere and I typed them up and sent them in and probably forgot about it because I figured there's no way. I tried to submit to other, you know, other things, not just book competitions, but you know, yeah. it was always an always. Well, you know what, and my poetry wasn't ready. There really is a reason those were not as priorities because I, I hadn't learned enough about the craft yet. And then one day I, I get a letter in the mail. I'm like, <laughs> you did. Wow. I'm like, that was pretty amazing. So, um, so it was put together the title poem, which is like in seven or eight parts, which is mm -hmm. a tongue-tied woman, I wrote um, when I was living in Telluride, Colorado. Mm -hmm. It was after a major breakup, a major difficult breakup with someone. Well, that's when I became a single mother, my mm -hmm. son's father. And, uh, and I just, I, that's the first time I'd written anything in a while. And I'd never written anything long before. It was really funny. And um, that piece just, it, I still have the notebooks, that's it. I wrote it all in one night. Pretty much the way it came on the page, very few yeah. changes. And so I had like enough to put together for a chapbook. And so since I was in college and I learned more about how to do that, I did that and that's how it happened. So it was, it was kind of an accidental book, mm -hmm. you know. 
Um, and thank goodness for chapbooks, which are amazing because they're small and short and they can be really closely thematically tied. And, um, you know, for a long time and for years, there weren't very many chapbook publishers in between this and recently. And now there's the people are doing chapbooks again. People are appreciating yeah. the form. It's like a, a concept album. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So I don't I compare it to that. So, so that's how that happened. Um, but yeah, there's some poems in there I'm still proud of. When did you start reading your, your poetry in public? I read for the first time in public in 1980, let's see, I think 87, at the Cantina on the Paseo in the Paseo District of Oklahoma City, which was the artist bar. Mm -hmm. That's where the people from the theaters would go to have their after, you know, their closing their parties. You can, to use an old-fashioned old Oki term, you couldn't swing a cat in there without hitting a poet or, <laughs> or a painter or whatever. It was just mm -hmm. like where we all were. And uh, I read it in open mic there one night. And their open mics were great because it wasn't just like poetry. It was like poetry or somebody would play a song or somebody would be part of a fiction thing. And so, mm -hmm. so I... Uh, Held my breath, and I think I have a picture still. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're reading that night. I don't know how, I guess one of my friends must have taken it and like gave, you know, a paper copy later. It's not like you have it on your phone mm -hmm. in the 80s. So, yeah, that's the first time I read it out. Um, and it's also when I discovered how much I like performance. Mm -hmm. And it gets me, uh, reading, doing readings, I, I get kind of a little buzz. Not sometimes almost hyperactive buzz. It takes me an hour to come down after a reading yeah. because I like the performance aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I found out later that, you know, teaching is performance. Mm -hmm. I have an undergraduate double major in theater. Oh, okay. Literature. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I learned I love performance uh, mm -hmm. that night. I was like, that's really cool. I can't play guitar, but I can read poems. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, I read a few more times there. And... Uh, then shortly thereafter, I went to New York State and other passels of poets uh, and did more and more and more readings. And so I took readings long before I wrote a book published. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think it is about readings, um, like just being in the presence of hearing uh, poetry spoken? I guess I'm thinking of the Scissor Tail Festival, mm -hmm. which maybe we can talk about later, but what do you think it does for poetry or for people? Just here. I think poetry doesn't let us forget it was originally an oral art. Yeah. Um, I mean, the craft elements of poems, the sonics, how the sounds work together, and how you can paint pictures with words and imagery. Those, um, you know, came down because it was an oral art. And um, actually, it was considered one of the, you know, so theater poetry. What was the other one? Aristotle. Anyway, um, so I think. That that sense of orality on the page, when you hear it, is is even richer, right? Mm -hmm. You close your eyes and you engage with the imagery, and you can hear the sound so much better. Uh, I um, have a very strict rule with my MFA students mm -hmm. who study poetry with me. They're not allowed to talk about a poem until they've read it once on the page and at least once out loud. So because you don't. You don't hear it otherwise, and it's it's to be heard, and you know it's it's ritualistic, right? Yeah. It's like um, church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, theater grew out of uh, ritual, dance, and theater. Uh, poetry also was a part of that. So, I think part of it also is then then there's the uh, there's the audience who participate in their own way, right? Because you know, they're mm -hmm. letting those words say something to them. And uh, like, you know, like musicians say, they can get a feel for the audience. You can feel if what you're reading is res uh, resonating or if maybe you ought to shift tone or something like that. So it, it seems to be still also very much a, a ritual that can tie people together that are kind of reading. And I think mm -hmm. that's what I love about it. Yeah. So you also write essays. I do. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about Oklahoma land. Um, mm -hmm. Could you show us the cover? Sure. Real quick. Mm -hmm. Tell us about uh, this image. 
this was a piece of graffiti in the Plaza District. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was, I came around the corner and I was like, shocked because she looks like me for one thing. Yeah. She looks like a cartoon version of me. She looks like all Scots Irish and Indian Native American girls in Oklahoma. That's what she mm -hmm. looks like. And um, and I, I was already put, trying to put this together and I, was, I, I didn't even have a title for it. And I come around and it says right there, Oklahoma land. That was part of the graffiti that wasn't added. Wow. It was just, it was exactly like that. And I, and I'm like, oh, there it is. That's, that's my cover. That's the title. It was just, it was like, bam. And I think a friend of mine has identified the artist so that I can offer some payment for the mm -hmm. use of that as my cover. And it's also kind of, I would like to actually have t-shirts made. I think I'll ask him if he can make yeah. t-shirts. <laughs> be a great t-shirt. You know? um, because I think it's just, it just spoke to me. Mm -hmm. It's like barren, and it is Oklahoma land, right? Yeah. A red homeland. Um, so yeah, that's what I did. And there's an essay um, in that book called Like a Fire and Dry Grass. Mm -hmm. Can you um, tell me a little bit about that? Um, that was the only essay. This is like a collected essay. Mm -hmm. It's all the rest of the essays in the book have been published before, but I wrote that essay specifically for this book. Um, and there's an incident that I, I relate in there that, um, that a person called me a racist. And, uh, yeah. And, um, and it shocked me because I never thought of myself as racist. Now, when I was younger, did I learn those words? I did indeed. Uh, with some of my closest friends in high school, I mean intimate friends, like in each other's, well, I got to go to their houses, they didn't get to come to mine. Or, you know, little black girls or Indian girls, or, you know, like I said, triracial town. And about six months after this incident happened, I was at my 30th high school reunion. And I was sitting there with a bunch of my girlfriends. And I said, y'all, I'm going to ask you a question. I said, what, 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 what? I said, would you tell me the truth? Oh, well, girl, you know, of course we'll tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> that's where my, they're my friends and stuff. Yeah. And I said, am I a racist? Was I a racist in school? And they just started, but they busted out laughing. <laughs> and they went, oh, Janetta, you always overthinking everything. <laughs> you know, they made fun of me for asking. Yeah. And, and, and my friend Andrea said, why would you... Why do you think you're a racist? Or well, why did you ask that question? I, I related the story. I really stood up. She said, where's that woman? I'm a harder. I'm a harder. <laughs> so, um, but that, and then I, I later, it hurt my feelings really bad. But then I, I tried to think around why her reaction to me would be like that. Part of it's my accent, my cracker accent. My southern, southeastern yeah. Oklahoma accent, and the fact that I came from what's called Little Dixie. And the topic with lynching. Yeah. yeah. So, oh no, it was, well, that was like I was still in graduate school. Yeah. So, so I started thinking about what is my place and, and what has been my relationship to race and mm -hmm. how did it change? And then, um, I don't know. So I was already thinking about that. And uh, one night I was, you know, messing around in the Oklahoma Historical Society archives, mm -hmm. which I had to ban myself from when I was writing my PhD, or I would have never gotten it done when I was writing my dissertation. And, you know, like, I would just Google my hometown, mm -hmm. I mean, not Google, but search it in the archives, uh, because not all of the newspapers from Wawoka are online yet. And mm -hmm. I, so I'd, like, do Wawoka, I, you know, look at my family names, which there are hardly any anywhere. And up pops um, an issue of the Norman transcript. Leave. I think I have to say which one it is in there. Mm -hmm. And it says, another Negro lynched in Wawoka. Now, I always asked questions. I always listened to stories. I never heard this. Right? So then I got back with my girlfriends on Facebook and I said, so did you guys know was this told as a cautionary tale? And they're like, well, it was kind of known, but nobody talked about it mm -hmm. because their parents uh, didn't want to 
frightened maybe, or perhaps because um, they were trying to look forward instead of backward. Uh, and even my girlfriends couldn't tell me exactly why they thought it was. You know, there were a lot of ideas. And then I found a book by a guy named Charles Kikto. He's from Shawnee. And this was actually his master's thesis, I think. And it, it's a history of lynchings in Oklahoma. Um, so I'm you know, going, so I look up that lynching. And then I'm talking to another friend of mine, a writer from Oklahoma, a guy, um, I think he was a year behind me at school. And he's written a couple of historical novels about Uloka. And I mentioned that I was doing, you know, this research. And he says, oh, no, there were two. <laughs> there was another one. Um, and the uh, Kiktoe book had it listed under Holdenville, which is six mm -hmm. miles away, just because that that's where they brought the guy back on the train. That the lynching was about something that happened in Uloka. And so combined with my questioning of myself, um, which was really a great gift this person gave me, I came to that conclusion, um, to make myself really think about that. And also, Terrence Hayes, who's a, a great American poet, African-American poet, mm -hmm. who wrote, by the way, a stunning poem about the Okima lynching. And um, he had an essay in which he said, you know, the question was, why don't white poets write about race? Mm -hmm. And his idea was that they don't because they've never been intimate with people of color. And that's what I went, uh, but I, I grew up intimate with people of color. You know, so they never been in each other's houses, they don't know each other's parents, you know. And, and so all of those things combined led me to try to place myself in um, the historical narrative of race in America, including, you know, the Seminole burnings. There, it was, uh, you know, there were, Native people who were lynched as well. Uh, there was a, a Jewish man in Tulsa who had that his home and almost beaten dead and dumped on the side of the road um, for being Jewish, I think. And also maybe he was a labor organizer. Um, and of course, the, the Tulsa race riot. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's the right term for it. But um, so I, you know, I kind of knew these things historically, but when I, but when I realized it had been in my hometown like 30 years before my grandparents moved there, 25 years, um, and that I had never heard it spoken of anywhere, not even whispered, not yeah. gloated about, <laughs> by people who might gloat about those things, nothing. Mm. Then I, it just caused me to really want to think about my, my own actions, my own beliefs, my family history, yeah. my town's history, and what it had to do with and of course, that was written during um, the um, was it Michael Brown. Yeah, 2013. Yeah, right that now. was written during Michael Brown time. So it was like, you know, yet again, that same kind of conversation that we seem to keep having to have over and over again. So that was in some ways my way of uh, doing my work for, on myself. Mm -hmm. and my culture in order to understand uh, how racism has disfigured us all. So that's how it happened. Yeah. <laughs> Just a series of um, serendipitous discoveries, really, I guess. Yeah. And some of the, uh, the cases discussed are just so... And it's just, it's hard to imagine that sort of thing even yeah. happening. It is. Um, you know, yeah. Senate Bill Number One, Oklahoma's first enacted state law was the Jim Crow law. So, yeah. and it, it's and it, by the way, it explicitly um, defined Native people as white for the purposes <laughs> of this law. Native people are white because I don't think they could write Jim Crow against Natives because it was federal land, and federal law. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So I just, um, and it was a friend of mine, uh, had, we had been talking about uh, that short story that I'd read a long time ago, but it's one of his favorites, and I went back and read it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's about a lynching, and, and it just the title of the story just seemed perfect. It's like a wildfire. Mm -hmm. so, so that's where it came from, and I'm really, uh, 
I think I may be more proud of that than anything I've ever written. It has the work. So it's yeah. good work. Yeah. Sure. Let's talk about your uh, latest book, What I Learned at the War. And I had a chance to read. Well, first let's talk about that image. Uh, I had a chance to hear you read some of the poems that are in here. But yeah, could you put the, the cover up real quick again? So, um, and, Tell us about that, because that is just... There is a young man named Jason Christian, who's an Oklahoma writer. He's gone off to Louisiana to go to school, but I'm mm -hmm. sure he'll come home. He's a native Oklahoman. Um, and he posted this on his Facebook page. And I immediately emailed him and said, that is the cover for my book. And, um, you know, it's a uh, it's done by Shawnee, and I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. this was caused by that tornado that he took out in the black school. And this would have been 2010, April, April 2010, because it cut a wide swath right, you know, right by Shawnee and then across mm -hmm. the highway and took out the love store. And I'm pretty sure that that's what happened to this house. Yeah. Um, but another thing, so, and it's such a tiny house, right? Uh, another thing that kind of drew me to it was there's a, there's a famous or infamous Southern novel called Tobacco Road. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the years it was published, but you know, it was kind of a bestseller. But it's very, um, it's about poor whites. Uh, but it's very uh, condescending and paints them all as stupid and worthless. But there's a scene that she describes in there where it's almost like she's looking into somebody's house like this, like mm. the front's been taken off. And it's almost, it's almost um, stage-like in the way yeah. she describes it, as if she can see inside the house or if the house is a stage. And she mm -hmm. describes, you know, their slovenliness and the fact that their bedroom and their kitchen's in the same room. And, oh, my God, you know, and it's got all these, like, savage sexual overtones to it. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it, I read that from my reading list from my dissertation. And it, um, just the whole scene just disturbed, has disturbed me for so long. And in some ways, mm -hmm. I saw that in there. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to tell the other side of the story, you know. Yes, there's hard things, but um, people's poverty is not um, that don't, poor people are not automatically less than human, right? Right. It's just not. And and so between you know, it was taken not too far from my hometown. It was taken by another Oklahoma writer. It it looks like a war. Right. And mm -hmm. the whole uh, tobacco road thing, it was just like, I just immediately saw it. And, and he gifted it to me. So oh, I did say his name, right? Jason Christian. Right? Yes. Look for him. He's a really great rock coming up Oklahoma writer. So at the Scissor Tail Literary Festival, which I keep mentioning, mm -hmm. um, it's in Ada. It's got to go. Mm -hmm. If you haven't, anyone listening here. Um, you read this poem called Driving Lost Roads, Listening to Jedi Mind Tricks. <laughs> A hazel, I guess I'm saying that. Right. Hazel, yeah. Um, Close enough. <laughs> Close enough. So, um, tell us about the Jedi Mind Tricks. <laughs> Jedi Mind Tricks is an underground hip hop group. Mm -hmm. um, so, not gangster rap, but uh, social criticism rap, and those guys are really smart, mm -hmm. well read. Oh gosh, like internationally well read, theoretically read, and yet they're from you know poor urban families. Uh, and I was driving around in Seminole County with my sister and um, a good friend of mine, who's also an Oklahoma writer, and he's a big fan of radical underground hip hop. And he mm -hmm. put this song on, he goes, I want you to listen to this because I think this is some kind of poem form. So mm -hmm. it sounds like a poem. And I listened and I said, you know, that sounds like a hustle. And, and I said, but, you know, I'll, I'll need to go and look at the lyrics. And, to, you know, and sure enough, the last stanza of the song Chalice mm -hmm. by Jedi Mind Tricks is a perfect puzzle, which is like a fourth century Persian form that uh, regained popularity in America in the last 25 years. Uh, and I mean, it's perfect. It has all the formal elements mm -hmm. of a puzzle on it, perfectly done. And, um, and it turns out in a hustle of the couplets, one doesn't necessarily have to follow the other one. So mm -hmm. you're like, but it, it, logically, they don't have to follow each other logically. Uh, so they're like, 
a two-line statement and a two-line statement and a two-line statement. It turns out that for me, that's a perfect form for a road trip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we were out on this road trip, and um, these are images I gathered and thoughts I had while I was on the road trip, uh, written uh, as a hustle. And I quote Jedi mind tricks at the top, and I also quote the poem that I hope Joy Harjo would let me put on my tombstone, which mm -hmm. is uh, Oklahoma will be the last song I ever sing. Um, so that's how it came to be. All um, right. Yeah. Do you mind reading it? No. Okay. Yeah, definitely read it. And by the way, when I say in here that the haughty GPS voice said yeah. cannot be located, it's true. Uh -huh. My sister and I were having a sisterly disagreement about whether to turn left or right. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, we were way down by the river in the woods and you can't, can't really see the horizon or anything. Okay. We go right. I said, no, we go left. All right. Go left. Because we both struggled with those roads when we were a kid. And I said, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll ask the GPS. And I pushed it on there. And that's what she said. You cannot be located. Um, <laughs> I should probably, I usually do this orally when I read it. Um, so Lima Town is uh, uh, one of Oklahoma's all black towns. My grandparents' uh, farm was just across the road oh, from okay. Lima. Um, and let's see what else did we say. The Green Corn Rebellion was a socialist rebellion that uh, was centered in Seminole County, Sasakwa, about, Sasakwa's like eight or nine miles from my hometown. Uh, there's, you know, you can look it up. There's lots of information on it now. There wasn't for a long time. And it was a tri-racial class rebellion in part as a response to um, the you know, rich man's war, poor man's violence was during the war. And I think everything else will make sense. Or close enough. Yeah. Driving lost roads, listening to Jedi mind tricks, a hustle for James. The quote from the song Chalice by Benny Paz of Jedi Mind Tricks. I'm once in a lifetime Haley's Comet out here. Gods and Earths and Moors. We're we Islamic out here. And um, Joyce, beautiful poem, Oklahoma will be the last time, last song I ever seen. Sorry. We all know there is only one road home, no other choice out here. You cannot be located, cannot be located, insists the haughty GPS voice. Out here, you cannot be. We see no other people for hours. All things man-made corrode into monuments of dread. Nothing is louder than prophesied silence. Souls recoil out here where anything might be. Just past a ghost town's melancholy edge, old possum sits staring at a red spotted toe. Fresh branches top the arbor at Megasuki Church. Rejoicing out here folks soon will be. Keystone Pipeline rips a deep bleeding wound. The morning river is running red. No trespassing sign declares if you're not arriving to exploit, out here you should not be. Me and sister singing and telling old lies, cursing the living and praising the dead. At brother's grave, the whiskey poured, then hoisted. Out here, law man, leave us be. Boarded up Main Street, Seminole Nation, at wind clan allotment, grave houses whisper shadow. In cold rain under Catalpas at Friedman's Lima Town, quoting the voids out here as we should be. Holdenville quick stop is flooded with tweakers hoping meth is the cure for their sorrow. Indian Casino promises fortune, but slots are nothing but noise. Out here, luck will never be. Tracing lines of resistance and sites of rebellion where farmers of the green corn bled. Ghosts chant revolution in Sasakwa streets. Their socialist voices out here will forever be. On this impossible day, a magic carpet ride with genie of the cross timbers and a dancing crow. A rebel gray sky is jealous of your eyes, of their burgundy joy out here where we cannot be. Great, thank you for reading that. You're welcome. Are there other poems from this book that you're uh, particularly attached to or proud of or that maybe took um, a long time to get right? 
Um, what are you going to talk about? Oh, uh, well, we'll start with the long time to get right part. Um, there is a long poem in here <clears throat> called The Unexplored Prairie. Um, and um, I wrote it really fast, but it took a lot of revision and a lot of thinking and maybe even more courage. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading this book that's quoted at the beginning. Um, Washington Irving came to Oklahoma because he was piggybacking on a surveying crew that was surveying the state for the removal of the native people. So, and that wasn't uncommon, like, you know, and, and of course the survey, surveyor was in the army, right? Um, so, um, it wasn't unusual for people to kind of travel with surveying crews at that time or other, other army attachments going somewhere. So there was some safety, especially in, in basically uh, wild places. And I love this book because this is his journals and his letters back to his wife. And um, I thought I was going to write a poem about all the things we've lost as far as flora and fauna go. Because, you know, I came from southeast mm -hmm. Oklahoma. Well, I thought we had tons of animals. We don't have anything compared to what he saw. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so many bears and mountain lions and, and wolves. And, every, you know, every corner was um, another amazing thing. Also, part of his job as a surveyor was to keep a catalog of edible plants, uh, what kind of timber was here. Mm -hmm. So it's basically like, like an uh, environmental handbook, you know, the Oklahoma environment, everything that he could write down about it. So I thought that's what this poem was going to be about, which is why it started, why, why it's divided into seasons, because mm -hmm. he talks about the seasons here. Um, and it took over about three lines into the poem, and it became a poem about um, the abusive household I grew up in. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say it was not my mother, it was not my granny, it was not my grandpa, mm -hmm. and it was not my father. <laughs> it was not my stepfather. So um, uh, it just turned on me, and it mm -hmm. took me a while to to formalize it, because sometimes for me when I'm trying to write about those kinds of things, I, I don't actually write a poem, right? It's like, meh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I've oh, got to get this out. And then in order for it to be a poem, you really do have to, um, well, you have to consider your audience. Uh, you have to give them something to hold on to. You have to shape it, right? So that mm -hmm. took me a long time to shape, mm -hmm. partly because of the emotional content. Yeah, and the memories. So that one took a long time. Um, there's a few poems in here that took me, I don't know, 40 years to write or more. Mm -hmm. uh, the one for the victims of the Girl Scout murders. Mm -hmm. um, they sent us home from camp. Oh, we were in the camp next door. Yeah. In the campfire girls camp. And when you're 16, the big thing was you got to go stay in Tenth City, which was way far away from the rest of the camp, and that's where we were, was in Tenth as well, not in cabins, we were in that tent. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know the, the thought, you know, remained, I would just, I would think about this regularly about those young women and their families, and, you know, the, the crazy aftermath of it, and um, the racial tensions, uh, between Native people and uh, non-Native people in Oklahoma that came about uh, because of them and because of the person that was actually sent to jail, uh, which, which a lot of people say, who knows, people still mm -hmm. uh, disagree about whether it was actually him. Uh, and this was all, you know, playing out on TV when I was 16. Uh, and then the Sirloin Stockade murder short two years later, there was a mass murder at Sirloin Stockade, which happened from the city. Um, and it seemed like those two events dragged us kicking and screaming into a new world, us meaning Americans. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Oklahoma, it's not that violence didn't happen before. I mean, Oklahoma's always been a place of violence. Yeah. So much bad. And these trees are so tall here because they're growing in, you know, 10 layers of blood. Mm -hmm. But that kind of, kind of random mass violence, um, seemed to wrench us out of the 50s, which we were still living in, <laughs> and push us into the 1980s. 
I kind of bookended it like so 16 I had like caught first car right and then the conservatives like hey murders were right after I graduated from high school I think the summer I graduated from there I graduated from high school so so it was like these two really like statewide traumatic events mm -hmm. kind of bookended my teenage years so it took me a long time to write that poem for the girls and um it makes an odd, it's almost surreal. It's almost a surreal poem because mm -hmm. in my mind still, it was a surreal moment, even though it was on television. And I'm sure, you know, I wasn't living here uh, when the murder bombing was happening. I was living in Telluride, Colorado, and I'd gone into the, to the pharmacy to get some cough syrup, and it was on television, you know, just, you know, just dropped right there. But I'm sure for people who were, living in the state and even maybe for many of us who were not then living in the state it was that another kind of rupture like that mm -hmm. right um i think it changed many things um about the way we see ourselves and what we do with ourselves so um yeah that one took three years also the one for my brother um uh, pastor which i think you want me to read yeah I, I still have dreams. Um, that's another thing I had dreams about was starting that plane in the lake. And I have, I have racked my brain and I still can't remember why I would do such an awful mean thing. Mm -hmm. Unless it was because I was jealous. Because um, my mother divorced his father and then she divorced my father, but I didn't have anything like that. He found like a thing he could put back together that that was his father and my mama, and I didn't have anything. And mm -hmm. I've thought about it, but I still don't remember the moment I decided that I'm thinking, because I wasn't commonly a mean person. And that's just cruel, what I did. I was really cruel. And, I, and the only thing I could think of that would make a kid fight me that cruel would be flat out jealous. Feeling like he had some connection to his father that I couldn't have. What was his name? Your brother. Philip Lane and Lee. There's a poem for him in my first book too. That are his true obituary that I wrote and mm -hmm. the obituary I gave him. He's all over this book. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of survivor's guilt, I think. Yeah. For my brother. Uh, because our experiences when we were children broke him early. And uh, I, I still think I could maybe I could have saved him somehow. Um, so and you know, that's how we come in, in the, I think I just didn't want to think about it for a long time because he died. So when he was 47, I was 43 and 94. Um, is that right? Yeah. Um, and uh, they just found him uh, in his apartment eight days later. So it was hard on all of us, mm -hmm. especially my mother. It was horrific for my mother. Um, and so I just like compartmentalized that for a while. No, it couldn't have been 94, it's 2004, because I was in graduate school here. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just like, I think I just totally compartmentalized his death to get through graduate school. And, um, and then all of a sudden these poems started coming in and I'm quite sure I'm not finished. Yes, as a matter of fact, I have a new poem and manuscript that, uh, that I wrote for him based on one of Kevin Hannah's poems, which was interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, is that before? Here, no? Yeah, before. I mean, it was, I wrote it like two years ago. So. Oh, wow. This is called Pastoral for My Brother. Today, I remember prowling the woods with you, smashing wild grapes into our haunted mouths, smoking the vines. You ran faster, your spindly three years older boy legs bounding across a darkening field. My seven-year-old shadow racing ahead of me, grasping for your boots as if it longed to be stitched to your heels. Where woods joined pasture, a meadowlark, alarmed by our laughter, squawked, dragged her spotted wing in decoy. Her chicks betrayed the grave game with laughter of their own. In the gully, among years of refuse, you found a marriage plate broken in half separating our mother and your father as surely as the divorce. 
A week later, I destroy your newly mended memento, threw the shattered porcelain pieces into the lake. I do not remember why. The metal lark still drags her wing. The shadows are even longer, reaching for you where I cannot go. Sometimes I still have hard time yeah. that one. Um, and I should say, this is set at the farm, right? Yeah. And uh, when my brother was 12, uh, early in his sixth grade year, um, he moved in with our grandparents because um, of the severe abuse directed yeah. towards him in our house. And so um, I felt like I was there to fight the fight. <laughs> <laughs> But that happened after that. But I, I, the only thing I can imagine is deep jealousy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Still feel bad about it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. A lot of my poems are apologies. You know, the one yeah. in, in Work Is Love Made Visible from my granny about her making, hand making my clothes mm -hmm. in seventh grade. Uh, you know, the mean girls started in on me because I, if I didn't have hand-me-downs for my cousins, I was wearing homemade clothes. But my grandmother was a seamstress. I mean, yeah. she was a pro, literally a pro. That's what she did for a living. I remember uh, someone in the Mean Girls was, was, uh, said something like, I look at you, you're wearing homemades instead of store buttons. And I was ashamed yeah. of my granny's hard work yeah. and her great skill. And so that poem was written, and yes, she got to see it before she passed mm -hmm. as an apology for that moment of um, being ashamed of yeah. these. I mean, I didn't know to say, no, they're not, they're tailored. <laughs> I didn't even know what that meant. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I said, she tailored my clothes, which is true. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so there's actually, there's several poems in this book that are actually apologies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everyone except my brother is going to read this. Yeah. Kind of on a different topic, but a related note, um, and I wanted to kind of bring this up during the interview. So, you're the current um, state poet laureate. Mm -hmm. Can you walk me through that experience about just your your journey with that um, sharing poetry with the public? Uh, it's like I told my husband, this is like <laughs> my Academy Award right here. <laughs> um, When, this is going to sound like it has nothing to do with it, but it does. Mm -hmm. When I was in junior high school in Lawoka, the State Arts Council was still, had a really rich artist in the schools program, um, which was abolished like in, I don't know, 80-something, because um, some of the schools did not like the kinds of things that artists were bringing in to talk to their children about. Mm -hmm. And now there's still a roster, but it's not like it used to be. I mean, all the school had to do was call them and they'd send somebody. Uh, so I had a port gun in my school. I also sat behind in church, Luoka's first poet laureate, Rudolph N. Hill. So I knew that poets were living, but, you know, real human mm -hmm. beings could actually be poets. They weren't all rich British guys who were dead. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so for me, this has been a fantastic and wonderful experience of being able to give that back to because I can you know there's a lot of Oklahoma poets and I know there's one out here somewhere right now mm -hmm. some 10 year old who's in a tree house mm -hmm. <laughs> He's writing poems or um, you know hiding out in the barn or wherever um, and so for me um, I get as much out of going to the schools as they do mm -hmm. I I made a particular practice of going to uh, little tiny rural schools because, mm -hmm. well, Wuoka we wasn't tiny when I was, well, we had a hundred people in our graduating class. Mm -hmm. uh, but because I want those kids to have a chance to do that, right? So, and then, you know, the teachers are doing great jobs, but particularly in those small rural schools, you know, um, they don't have enough support. Um, and oftentimes, I'm sure this happens in city schools too, uh, but oftentimes those communities are kind of broken and uh, the teachers end up being like godparents to their children. Mm -hmm. You know, they keep closed closets in the schools and they, that's the only place, you know, kids have enough to eat. They have breakfast and lunch, you know. So, um, 
I want to be able to help people have poetry the way I do that saved my life. <laughs> so, um, like for instance, I just went to Avant Schools, which is Avant, it's about 10 miles north of Sky Turk and a little bit west of the Osage country. And um, the school was first through eighth grade, and there's 82 kids in the school. Mm -hmm. So, wow. you know, that's like 10 kids a class. And the teachers teach two years. So, one teacher teaches first and second, one teacher all together. Almost like, you know, the older mm -hmm. kind of one year school. Yeah. It's first and second, second and third, or third and fourth, fifth and sixth, seventh and eighth. So, um, and uh, oh, they're so dedicated and they're so good to their students and um, they're really literally saving lives mm -hmm. and working hard and uh, you know the kids they're ready they're ready to say something mm -hmm. um they just uh, i just offer them another way to say it you know and some of the some of the poetry uh, you know i'd like to have to turn around and wipe my eyes i didn't want to see me you know, I don't want to upset everybody by me crying, but they're mm -hmm. just so brave and they're so smart and they're so decent and good. Mm -hmm. And most of them, especially the smaller schools, and, and many of them in dire straits um, as far as, you know, poverty or yeah. uh, other kinds of lacks. So, uh, yeah, it's been a gift to me. I mean, one of my first... Uh, things I did is the uh, Children's Rehab Hospital mm -hmm. in Bethany, Oklahoma, Children's Rehab Hospital in Bethany, that offered me and asked if I'd come there. And uh, they brought in two of the students, because you know, they have full-time school there, because a lot of those kids live their whole lives in the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, and they brought in two young people who had the uh, ability to work with me. One of them used, uh, like a, I don't know what they're called, they're a special kind of picture book so they can make sentences by pointing at the pictures and the other the other one could, could talk fairly well and so uh, one of his helpers one of the school helpers wrote for him so we wrote a poem we had a great time we uh, wrote about um, you know something unusual they might have seen in the parking lot you know mm -hmm. and then I went around and, and read individually to some of the patients and their families there and I would have never gotten to do that if I had been up on the poet laureate because they saw it in the paper and they called me. Um, so I've gone to a lot of schools. I think last April I did 24 or five events. And uh, I think I wrote at 26 this April, plus I do October. So I, I do them like all at once. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easier for me. Um, and also, uh, you know, April, that's when they want poets. So yeah. you know, the National Poetry Month. <laughs> and then lovely things like Scissor Tail and doing the uh, Poets Laureates reading. Uh, uh, Tulsa Community College has been having one for several years. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this year Nathan Brown couldn't join us, but last year it was me and Nathan and Ben Myers, the last three, mm -hmm. you know, poets laureate and then we had another poet's laureate reading in Norman and there's going to be another one in Stillwater in the fall so, yeah. <laughs> so you know um, and I have so many friends in so many places here so for me it's like a it's kind of like a pilgrimage I think is the mm -hmm. best um, and I always make time to drive off the major highways I don't usually catch bowlers on the major highway I catch lots of bowlers on the back um, you know, I've been to Langley Library, which is in a very small town at the bottom of, uh, bottom, I shouldn't say bottom, on the south end of Grand Lake, mm -hmm. and to Benita, um, Oklahoma, to, um, where else I go? Went to three places. Oh, to Miami, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, so most of my trip this time has been on the eastern half. And uh, I'm going to do some more southern things in October. I'm also going to the Panhandle, because I don't know the last time. I went on the poet where I went to the Panhandle, so I got a guy in, and I went to Woodward, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I've got so far. I mean, I have, I'm sure there's others that I just can't come up with right away, but my calendar is on the Oklahoma Poets Laureate website, and it's a public uh, calendar that's also on my website. If people are curious about where I've been and what I've done, they can just skim through my calendar last yeah. year and this year, where I'm going next, and, um, 
but I really do believe uh, it's you know that it's my service that counts here. Mm -hmm. right? Service, service to my community, service to poetry. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about this just uh, in conversations we've had. Red dirt poetics. What, <laughs> what is that? Um, I borrow that term from mm -hmm. the musical. Um, I didn't really call it a movement or a school, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, because I read a really great essay about red dirt poetics, and it may have been William Savage who wrote it. Um, I will have to check that. Yeah, we can. Check that. Um, and um, and when she's making a case that there is this thing called red dirt music, despite the fact that it's it's really very diverse. But, uh, you know, the sounds can be different. You know, there's just singer songwriter, there's some red dirt musicians are actually, you know, play what something would be more like rock, right, or blues. And, um, and about how there are these particular things that make it red dirt music. Um, you know, there's a, a classical country and sometimes bluegrass undertone uh, overlayered with rock and roll because. But like when I was a kid in the seventies, and a lot of these guys were, you know, the early people from uh, Red Dirt was the like seventies and eighties, you know, late seventies and end through the eighties. Everybody listened to everything. Like I had, you know, Waylon Jennings, and next mm -hmm. to Waylon Jennings was Foreigner, and they said that was the Rolling Stones, and there was Johnny Cash. This was all in my, you know, eight track player. <laughs> yeah, and later cassette tape. So we we had just like this broad. Nobody only listened to what kind of music. No one I knew. Listen to that kind of music, um, you know, and so that's one of the things he talks about is that um, it's uh, inclusive term rather than exclusive, mm -hmm. and it's not prescriptive. Like you can't say, um, you know, you can't be red dirt because of whatever. Actually, I, I was mm -hmm. one of the earliest red dirt musicians was in my audience last night, and Anna uh, came out with this later. He was in medicine medicine show. For years, that was his band. So, um, I think also maybe one of the things he mentioned was kind of the storytelling quality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to think about those things in my um, opening essay to the Oklahoma Anthology and what makes an Oklahoma poetics. I do think uh, that it has, even with the lyric poems, mm -hmm seem to have a storytelling quality, like a, mm -hmm. almost a sitting on my front porch quality, which I, I don't mean to, that to sound, it's hard mm -hmm. to describe. Because a lot of these terms I use, some people might use them as disparaging, and I don't mean them that way at all. Mm -hmm. It's like community storytelling, mm -hmm. right? And state storytelling, and individual yeah. story, all these layers of uh, who we are. Um, I think, uh, there's kind of recognition of the hard life that um, mm -hmm. at AUZ being OP, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. And yet, there seems to be, a, you know, a kind of, and, and when I say OP, I mean all of this. Right? I'm mm -hmm. not just talking about white people. Yeah. Um, the Native people, African American people, you know, the blues is in the music. There's, um, you know, sometimes native, especially drums or shells, that, you know, you can hear the rhythm of that. Mm -hmm. um, so all, all of us who are now obese, let's, let me put it that way, um, they're, we're, we're kind of tough, uh, or have traditionally been kind of tough. And um, occasionally, after a tornado, after the mer bombing, we can hold on for just a little while to the ability to lay down the things that divide us. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing. Oh, we yeah. cry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, but there seems to be that kind of, you know, we can make it kind of thing. Yeah. And they're writing. Um, and of course, then there's the the content things, you know, you cannot be an OP writer unless you talk about a tornado at least 
right? <laughs> or do you have to write poems? Or the weather in general, the wind, yes. the amazing wind, the uh, red dirt. Mm -hmm. um, and I say, you know, that's not true. You can, mm -hmm. but this is also something many of us share, right? You know, because yeah. our environment. It's funny. My husband's from Michigan, and he lived in California for a long time. He said, "Yeah." In California, we used to drive somewhere to go visit nature because you know what? In Oklahoma, Mother Nature comes to visit you. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> rip, rip your roof off. <laughs> and, which happened to our house in the 2010 tornado oh, yeah. that lit um, us. So, um, so I think there are these things that the under the storytelling style, the content sometimes, uh, the. some courage, kind of a, almost sometimes um, perhaps illogical courage <laughs> in the face of things, particularly mm -hmm. for you know Native people, African American people, and, you know, a lot of the poor people, no matter what color, some this kind of courage and hope despite all odds kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear that in a lot of the songs. And like, you want to talk about dirt music, man, my favorite people right now, I have just, if I, if I still had like eight tracks or cassettes or had a record, I would have had to buy new ones now of all, mm -hmm. all the albums of the Turnpike Troubadours. Because one of the things those guys do is uh, they have a fabulous ear and memory for Oklahoma vernacular language, for sayings, mm -hmm. for sayings. And they're all over their songs. And sometimes they use them straight up, and sometimes they just do a little twist on them that gives them a whole new way to look at it. And, mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm in English should listen to their songs. That's what I think. <laughs> um, truly, because they're using, um, you know, you married that girl, you married your family, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you dodged a bullet, you know, all these, and even Ogrewoods and that, things that I hadn't heard uh, and very rarely get said, uh, except by the older people where I came up from uh, in years and they are taking those and making them all new through their songs and it's mm -hmm. just brilliant not to mention they're fabulous musicians yeah so um yeah so um i see in their music much of what i'm trying to do in my mm -hmm. poetry uh, which includes capturing a language that's disappearing mm -hmm. languages depending yeah. on which area you're from um as a matter of fact i was at a benefit the Red Dirt Relief Fund benefit here in Tulsa last year. And I was, you know, saturated all day, you know, the Rangers, the Red yeah. Dirt Rangers, and uh, Mandy Crouch, and, um, you know, the zillions of magnificent musicians that were there. And at one point, I posted to my Facebook page, I said, you know, I'm beginning to think this whole cult lawyer thing is superfluous because we've got no dirt music. <laughs> but, you know, I was kind of overwhelmed at the moment. But still, I think it is another way, uh, it is another kind of writing. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a kind of writing, a poetics that uh, reaches maybe more people than my stuff on the page does, and mm -hmm. I love what's I love what's out there. So did I? I did I describe red dirt poetics? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think so. So, what's your best writing advice to aspiring writers, established? Read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Read broadly. Um, um, I'm so sad sometimes when people tell me, well, you know, I write poetry. I'm like, yeah, well, cool. Who do you read? They say, oh, I don't read poetry. And yes, I've been told that. Um, mm -hmm. Or the last poem, you know, the only poetry they read was from the last century. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not being snotty here. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't get a college degree until I was 37, and, you know, I checked out books of poetry. From, so it's available. So I'm not making a, a class or educational statement here. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to read. And you know, if you look through my books, you'll see half these poems are from some other kind of writing, right? You know, yeah. the surveyors' reports or uh, uh, other kinds of texts that I find stuff in and sitting down mm -hmm. history and science. So I've got a whole series of new poems that I'm writing about. Um, I think it's going to be just about bugs, but it may be about bugs and reptiles, but not about, but there are entities in the poems and all the mm -hmm. titles are the. Well, the vernacular of the name and the Latin name. Oh, wow. um, so, you know, I look up the Latin names and read more about, you know, these like dragonflies. Mm -hmm. And the vernacular of the name is uh, Snake Doctor, which I think is fabulous. Um, 
and which I was delighted to find that Ralph Ellison used in a couple of his short stories. I'm like, yeah, see, he's okay. <laughs> yeah, he really is okay. Um, so, you know, read fiction, read nonfiction. Um, you got to learn something new. Because, as I was saying about inspiration earlier, it's not something that falls on you. It's everything all the time. And, mm -hmm. and the more you can expand your reading habits, the more you say, oh, that's so cool. And you start yeah. thinking about it and then it becomes a poem. So read, um, and I'm not going to give the advice that a lot of people give that you have to sit down in a chair every day because uh, uh, honestly, I thought that was a very genderly classed thing. Mm -hmm. Because you know, as I said, they're like these guys, um, mm -hmm. and especially in the 19th century, you know, because they were mostly lords yeah. spending their grandparents' money. Uh, you know, but like, you know, Hemingway and those guys, mm -hmm. and they did that, like you said, you have to sit down in your chair every morning at six o'clock and you work till noon, and then you have lunch, mm -hmm. and you sit down in your chair and you work till five. First of all, who brought your lunch? Yeah, about the same. <laughs> it's trust money spent in him anyway. <laughs> uh, oh, well, he always had women. Yep. Uh, you know, who's doing, uh, who's keeping the house, who's working the day job? Now, some of them did. I have to say yeah. some of them worked day jobs, but uh, but this was the way they put it out, right? This is the only way to be a writer. Well, it's gender because there are all kinds of women behind them doing all the work, so they don't have to. Um, so they can sit in their chairs for you know, nine hours a day. And it's classed because uh, maybe, you know, maybe they had enough money to sit in their chairs from that time to another. And for me, when I started writing, I was working in hospitals and nursing homes, I read my head. Um, so what I will say is find out what your best process is. Find out the process that's most useful for you and most productive and honor it. Mm -hmm. Honor it deeply. I have to clean my desk. Mm -hmm. uh, before I sit down, I you know my pens and pencils are here. Before I said I sat down to write. I write mostly on the computer now because I'm yeah. really bad on writing in my hands, and it's mm -hmm. hard for me to write. It's almost illegible now, and it hurts. So you know it has these two pens over here, and the mouse is here, and the hole, and my my room has to be uncluttered. Mm -hmm. um, and someone said to me sometime, oh, well, you're just avoiding writing, and I said no, no, that's my ritual. That's my getting ready. Yeah. for writing and clearing my mind and getting ready to concentrate. So that's what you do. Also, my friend and co and faculty member at Red Earth MFA, Allison Aimed, whose grandparents are from Tulsa, mm -hmm. <laughs> she, um, she says there's two kinds of writers. There's bingers and plotters. Plotters are the mm -hmm. ones who, no matter what time of day it is, and watch it or how much money you have who set aside a certain time you know mm -hmm. for a lot of parents it's like after nine o'clock and by two o'clock because their kids are in bed yeah. um who have this set uh, ritual of writing uh, those are the plotters p-l-o-b-d-e-r-s and the bingers are people like me well i might not write a poem for three or four months and then i'll write six or seven or eight or nine because they've been rolling around but I used to be able to keep a lot of that in my head, much more than I can now as I've gotten older. Um, so now I use Siri, like if I, uh -huh. I'm afraid I'm going to forget something. Hey Siri, you know, yeah. especially when I'm driving because I catch a lot of these things before so I'm driving. Um, so, uh, so I'm a plotter and, it, and what it is is that I'm a binger. It's because it's been going on all up here and I just write it down. I get a feeling in my chest. It's like... Mm -hmm. um, like being full, but not like, like being emotionally full. It's like, I can feel it coming up in my chest. And I'm like, okay, I'm to write them down. <laughs> so, so whatever your process is, honor that, you know. And if you had to create a process around having kids or having a job or not having a job and it's working for you, that's fine. It doesn't matter what it looks like. I, uh, I tried a couple of years ago. I went to a fantastic workshop with a couple of, well, three of America's great poets, Ellen Bass and Marie Howe and Dorian Locks. Oh, and Dorian is in my dissertation, so I was like, um, and I thought, okay, this is the time I'm going to become a plotter because now I work from home most of the time uh, uh, for the MFA. And uh, so, like, I have an office, a chair, a desk, and 
you know, my husband goes off to work in the morning and I go downstairs with, with my coffee and go work. Okay, so now's the time I should become a plotter. And I tried, I tried so hard. And I, you know what, the same thing happened to me that happened keep diaries. I was trying to get up and write every morning, at least you know, journal again or write a poem every morning. I didn't bore myself to do, so I'm just going to keep it up. So I just went back to being a good journal. Yeah, yeah, that works for you. Yeah, it works for me. Yes. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about before we, before we end with your signature? Yeah. I just want to say that um, I'm, I'm really glad this uh, project is going on because uh, I don't know how many people realized how many uh, writers there are in Oklahoma at all yeah. stages of writing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the accomplished amateurs who write for themselves, the people who are moving into being professionals, uh, and not just the ones who are still here, but some who have had to leave off for work. Um, I've told you about my spreadsheet. Yeah. Oh, my, <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Stop. <laughs> um, you know, I think I have 250 people on there right now who are living in their living writers right now who uh, spend the majority of their life, you know, they're growing up in Oklahoma or have deeply influenced through the time mm -hmm. of the year. And um, I just, and maybe Tulsa Lit Fest has helped showcase mm -hmm. some of that. And, you know, of course, Scissor Tail Festival, uh, that's been uh, a part of Ken's. Uh, program from the beginning to say, hey, here we are, fly yeah. over country, we've got poets, we've got fiction writers, you know. Um, I just wish that, uh, like, I could figure out some kind of project where we could bring home, like, you know, a bunch of the people are gone and have a bunch of people here all together and just, like, stand in moss, a moss in the middle of the street in Tulsa, in the middle of the street in Oklahoma City, yeah. and say, hi, y'all, we're here. Yeah. There's lots of open mics uh, all over mm -hmm. the state. There's writers clubs, there's critique groups. Uh, so I, I just I just wish I could make that better known. So I yeah. talked to everybody about it and the poet laureate thing, mm -hmm. so maybe I am doing my part. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Okay, so let's end with the uh, directive. Yes, um, I wrote this for Oklahoma Today. They asked me for a new poem to go with an article, uh, well, an interview uh, they did about me as poet laureate, and uh, um, so I'm, I'm calling this my semi-official uh, Oklahoma poet laureate poem. Um, so the title is uh, taken from a thing called a medical directive. Uh, when people get to a certain age, their doctor wants them to go make a med medical directive or living will, what it's sometimes called, it's to say, mm -hmm. this is what I want done when I'm near death, you know. Plug me in, unplug me, you know. Mm -hmm. Heroic measures, no heroic measures, that kind of thing. Um, and so this is my directive. You birthed me, land of arrow and hoe, your red rock fossilized deep in my bones. Near a rural mailbox, a young war widow recalls sweetheart's kiss under mistletoe. Red-headed woodpecker taps a hollow oak, spiraling golden eagles in vivid vertigo. A tire swing spins in a shadowed grove, searching horizon for a child long gone. Down a trail on the prairie worn by buffalo, glimpse of a gray fox at the bottom of a slope. Hunter sets his sights on a white-tailed doe, venison's better than poverty's half-loaf. Scissortail sings on the branch of black willow, coyote yips in the hills a comical robe. Alone in sere pasture under sky's blue bowl, crow call a code that catches in my throat. Under a flat yellow stone up a dusty red road, plant my ashes near we woke up on a grassy plateau. Thank you. Beautiful. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you.